they will they're going to do the swap here. So. Yeah. Well, no, that, that was this one. Was yeah. Yeah. Hey everyone, welcome. Yeah, I'm Morgan, Morgan Finberg. <laughs> I'm PTL of Keystone. You guys probably saw the uh, keynote. That's why you're here. I hope. If you're planning on seeing some other session, you might be in the wrong room. Can't help you there. Uh, today, I'm here. Uh, Guillaume's here. Jesse Wong. We're going to do a quick rundown on the technical piece, technical uh, hurdles, and everything we ran into for putting together what you saw on stage this morning. I'm going to ramble a little bit here about what what the crazy idea was and how we got here, and then I'm going to hand it off to. Jesse and Guang to talk about that, and then we will cover the rough edges and hopefully leave plenty of time for lots and Q lots of Q and A, because that's probably why a lot of you are here. Figure out how you can actually make something like this work for yourself. So, Keystone to Keystone Federation. It's the core of what we have. It's where, as we described, you have a token from your local Keystone. You ask for a SAML assertion. Let's use standards, and you then move on. You then get your use that SAML assertion to authenticate to the remote service provider, and then it works the same as everywhere else. You uh, use OpenStack. Everything looks pretty much the same. So we really had this crazy idea, but as you can see, uh, you know, trying to diagram out how all that stuff works. Well, the long and short of it is. You end up with a token that's not from the cloud that you started from. The crazy idea came to, came to mind that we'd love to see a real world case where Keystone to Keystone Federation solved actual problems that, com that companies have. How do I do rapid add of resources? How do I, rapid, how do I handle um, the case where I need a provider in a geographic location that I don't have a data center? It's just it's difficult to it's difficult to do with current with the current open world of state of the art of OpenStack in say Juno, because you have to find either a provider and then you have to write a whole bunch of glue code to get you into the remote cloud. You need to figure out oh I need passwords for each cloud. I need to either use Ansible or Puppet or a whole lot of other things. After we sat down and said well we have this cool thing called that we're calling Keystone Keystone Federation, Identity Federation. We looked around and said, what industries really do run into this problem? Television and film clearly have, this, have these problems, live in this world. And clearly it makes a difference to be able to turn on and turn off a lot extra resources when you're into like pilot season, because that's a scary amount of extra work to do. I know, trying to get meetings with you is a challenge. <laughs> so I really only have one, one additional question here, and I think that it's a really important one to cover. Get, you know, why, are you, why did you pick OpenStack versus some of the other, some of the other like, options out there? I mean, it's, there are a lot of options. We wouldn't be here talking to all these wonderful people today if you hadn't picked OpenStack. Maybe somebody else, but. We'd be at an Amazon summit. <laughs> right, OK, sure, <laughs> sure. You, but. What's the what, why OpenStack? Because you did you know use OpenStack on top of Amazon. Why um, why did I choose OpenStack? Um, choosing a cloud solution is sort of like a marriage. Um, it's like a relationship, um, and and you try to find a common interest that you both have, and uh, for us it was it was being open and it was about about being able to get away from sort of the proprietary infrastructure that media and entertainment has been stuck in for a long time. And, and to some degree, when we first uh, got involved with OpenStack three and a half years ago, it was the promise of federated identity. Even back then, it was the promise of, of being able to scale out instantly and, and migrate across providers and not necessarily be locked into one provider or another for, for a multitude of reasons. So that's why we chose OpenStack. Cool. So I'm going to, I'm going to now turn this over to uh, Jesse so he can talk about hosted private cloud and the awesome stuff that Bluebox did to make this happen. 
Right. So Blue Box, we are hosted private clouds. Every one of our clients gets their own entire cloud. So in this case, Guillaume and Digital Film Tree got their entire cloud to themselves. Uh, but I think we had maybe the easiest time out of everybody in setting this up. Because we give them their own cloud, we didn't have to implement it on an area that had other people on it. All we had to do was stand up the cloud, set up the relationship, and give them the access, and off they went. Um, but let's talk a little bit about what was specifically different in a blue box environment. So our clouds, uh, one of the options we have with our clouds is hyperconvergence, where we're running our control and our compute in the same place, and we're running some of our services, a lot of our control services in the same place. Uh, and we're also terminating SSL with hot proxy, and we're doing active active load balancing with hot proxy as well. So what that means is our services like Keystone aren't necessarily directly listening for external communication. All that's bouncing through uh, hot proxy, and uh, that also means that they're running on the same host as some of the other services. And what that meant as a challenge is that the Keystone as a service provider is designed around running behind Apache. And we weren't really running behind Apache for, for Keystone at, at that point. We were running uh, Horizon behind Apache, and that was one thing. But trying to introduce Keystone behind Apache on the same host that Horizon was running behind Apache was somewhat entertaining. Um, particularly because we implement our software installs as virtual environments. You know, we want Horizon to exist entirely within its own virtual environment. We want Keystone to exist entirely within its own virtual environment. Apache WSGI doesn't really like that idea of running multiple processes in different virtual environments. So in this particular case, we had to allow uh, Apache to share the Python path of both virtual environments. And you were pretty lucky that, uh, that the services didn't have too wild of conflicting ideas about what they wanted in their environments. And so it worked out pretty well. Um, some of the other challenges were had to do with, with HTTPS termination. Uh, SAML is, wants to have the HTTPS come all the way through to Apache, and we weren't doing that. We were terminating the, the SSL at Hot Proxy before sending it on to Apache. So there's a few tweaks we had to make in Hot Proxy in, in order to pass all the right things along for SAML to accept what it was getting, and a few tweaks on the SAML side as well, so that it was getting, it was expecting what it's going to get out of out of uh, Hot Proxy. And you're going to tell the world what all those tweaks are, right? Yeah, um, some of those were pretty much just documentation tweaks. Some of those uh, we were already discussed out in the community. We just had to find them and implement them. Um, but yeah, that was that was pretty much it. I think that's. Oh. Yep. Guess what? Testing. Yeah, so we have a little bit of a hard time. So Jesse have an easy time. We have a hard time getting the stuff to work in public cloud. Primarily because we are multi-tenant cloud, so that's which means is that we you know share hardware and you know things like that. So we have a lot more requirement to get it up and running than just spun off in a separate instance. So. First of all, HP public cloud. So like I said, we have multi-tenant cloud. And we have MongoDB backends, uh, which have two regions. So we have uh, east and west. And then um, we have a Mongo web cassette, which is um, uh, running on those two regions. And then we have our own Mongo drivers, So which means that we are running Keystone uh, from upstream, but we have our own Mongo driver backends. And we also run our stuff in Apache. So we've been running Apache. So lucky for us. Unlike Bluebox, we've been running Apache since day one when we have Keystone up in public cloud. So that's, that part is much easier. And then, of course, it requires a uh, triplet. Um, so that's part of the requirement for Keystone's Keystone Federation. I think that's part of the requirement for um, Keystone as a service provider um, type of federation as well. And like I say, we are tracking Kilo. So what's running in the public cloud right now is pretty much based on Kilo. So before we can run this stuff in public cloud, so when we deploy a new feature in public cloud, so we have to go through a whole bunch of crap. I think one of them is uh, security review, right? So our security you know, team got to ask us questions. So they're based on their you know, threat modeling on this uh, Stripe model, right? you know, things like spoofing, tampering, and all that stuff, right? So they ask questions like, you know, hey, if the identity provider got compromised, you know, what happened? Right, so if somebody say intercepts a SAML assertion, can the guy replay over and over and get tokens? Um, if we don't 
protect the communication link, you know, what happened? And how do we establish trust? You know, all these kind of stuff. So they asked us a bunch of questions. It turns out there was a bug that was pretty critical that we fixed, which is 1042916. It could be like Adam, you know, <laughs> remember that. <laughs> That bug is that we basically had to, you know, without that fix, we would have to turn off signature validation, which, <laughs> <laughs> which is not good. So we basically had insecure SAML assertions, like non-validated SAML assertions? Yes, is that pretty it? much, okay. yes. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so we had to fix this bug before we can make it into production. Uh, that bug had to do with, you know, the way we treat namespace in, uh, in XML. So, if we, you know, the way we do, you know, we sign the, uh, the SAMLs that we use this tool called um, XML SCC1, and we sign the stuff, and then we basically bundle that up, and then when we, on the other side, when we validate that, turns out, you know, with the XML library, if you don't explicitly namespace the stuff, it just assign you an arbitrary namespace, and then that basically invalidates the signature. So we had to fix that bug. And also, unlike private cloud, with, with, the, uh, with the public cloud, we, you know, identity data is uh, tied to accounting, all right? So when this Keystone, Keystone Federation feature first um, introduced, it was based on discrete identities. So which means is that you can map an identity to a group, right? So that identity doesn't necessarily need to exist in the, in the uh, service provider. But with public cloud, that's, uh, that's different because we need to be able to map an identity to an account so we can meter on that identity and be able to build the guy, right, on the usage, you know, things like that. So luckily, you know, uh, we got some help from, from Merrick, right, CERN, basically, um, you know, introduced this uh, map to a direct um, identity feature, which we can take advantage of. That, that helps on federation across the board, not just with this. I mean, that was, that's, a, that's a huge win. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, like Jesse touched on uh, earlier, so we have to make network changes. Like, we you know, we have a load balancer. So we have to make it um, so that the session sticks, right? So we have kind of session affinity. And then we also have to make sure we preserve the uh, request URL. Turns out, uh, Shiplet has, they validate this binding, which basically means it's at the time when you create the signature, uh, you have to know what the request URL is. That basically binds to an endpoint. So if you route through a bunch of proxies, if you, you know, if you don't preserve that endpoint, um, Shiplet's gonna give you an invalid signature. So we have to make some, you know, um, network changes to make sure we preserve the, um, the request URL. And identity management for public cloud is a little bit um, involved because it involves, right now, when you create a new identity, it's a, both configuration and administration changes. So the lines basically blur between configuration and administration. Administration to me is just API, right? Configuration, it requires a bunch of stuff. Like, you know, you, know, you write chef recipes and public, you know, whatever. Um, so for us to deploy this feature, we have to, you know, uh, write a bunch of chef recipes, uh, uh, create the data bags um, to push the, um, the, the, the meta, uh, XML file that contains the, uh, um, the, the, the public key for, uh, for, to validate the signatures. And uh, also administration for us, you know, right now, if we want to create a new identity provider, create a new map, those have to be done with someone with L3 support privilege and above. And those API has to be um, audited, right? What? So it means nobody can just go in and mess with the map. What do you mean by L3 support? So what is L3? L3 is basically guys like us, <laughs> the guys that, that know deep into the code and all that good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So you know when you yeah so when you have problem with HP Public Cloud, you pick up the phone. You know someone, you know probably L1, L2 guy would pick up the phone, and they'll try to troubleshoot it. And if they can't do it, they call up the L3 guys, and you know so we go and then and then look at the log and all that. But even looking at the log itself, right, because we have to deal with compliance, we can't just log into the box. And we have to request permissions and all our keystrokes are logged and all that, all that good stuff. Um, so all the changes are fully audited. So you can't just change the map. Because you know one of the dangerous things in, in, in Federation, Keystone, Keystone, Keystone Federations, if you, if you don't have the map set up correctly, you could you know, accidentally map to a different account, you know, which you can get some freebies from those accounts. 
So we have to make sure those are correct. Um, yeah, also for public cloud, whenever we deploy a new feature in the public cloud, we have to make sure you know everything still works correctly, you know, make sure our performance is good. And basically, since Zipla is a different process that we introduce, we have to make sure we're monitoring that process. Uh, you know, make sure if it you know doesn't chew up a whole lot of resource in the node. Um, we have to make sure our regression tests still look good, and you know, rate limiting documentations and support runbook. You know, there's a whole bunch of stuff that we have to do before we can introduce a new feature in the, into the public cloud. So runbook is something like you know, if Shiplet you know, uh, you know, decide to throw a tantrum, you know, what 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 can our support guys do? Right? Should we go reboot it, or should, you know, how do we safely reboot that box? You know, things like that. So we have to document those. So that's pretty much <laughs> what we did. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of rough, there are a lot of rough edges on Identity Federation. Let, we'll be upfront and say that. The really cool thing is that they're just they're just rough and easily polished. We have a lot of wish list items we would really like to fix before. You know, we tell the person who's just getting into OpenStack and just barely scratching the surface that. It's really easy to do this. Well, it wasn't really easy to do this. It's quite doable, and none of the rough edges prevent this from being a reality, and that's the really cool part. But, you know, let's be fair. We're not really chasing down a rabbit hole here. It's the Cheshire Cat that's going to come after us. But here are all the things that no one really would tell you about unless you happen to have done a project like this. And I'm going to let Jesse and uh, Guang go over the variety of wish list items and rough edges. So doing our senior VP keynote, so people say, you know, he wants to be able to run an OpenStack without a PhD degree. So this is PhD education right here. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know. You shouldn't need a PhD, so we'll, we'll downgrade to a master's. Yeah, yeah okay. <laughs> so, so some of these uh, basically um, that we can do to make it better. Um, things, like I said, you know, earlier we have this, you know, the fine line between configuration and administration, right? So right now, to be able to deploy um, Keystone Keys to Keystone Federation is both. So ideally, we want this to be a purely administrative function, which means that whenever we need to create an IDP, we should be able to do that all through APIs. You know, create an IDP create the protocol, create the mapping, all down to APIs, and then it, things will just work, right? Um, so this is similar, with, similar to how, you know, where we moving toward uh, in the uh, per domain specific driver configurations. So we need to uh, store these IDP data into, uh, into SQL backend. Wow. Yeah, for, from our point of view on this one, it meant that you know, all of our configuration is driven by Ansible playbooks, and we have published Ansible roles that are all open source. But in order to implement this type of feature, we had to start leaking, not leaking, but we had to start faking customer data into the public uh, playbooks that would get filled in later by site-specific configuration. But we had to couch it in a way that you could have one provider, you could have 10 providers. We have to be able to loop over them and have a bunch of stub things in there that if you actually ran it without providing a, a real provider, uh, you could get some things on your file system that you might not want and your keystone may not work. So we'd really, really like to see that uh, site-specific, that customer-specific type of stuff stay out of the system configuration and instead be data that, we, that goes into the database once it's all set up. Right. Yeah, and then the other, the other thing for us, which, you know, is like whenever we make configuration changes, our security team, team get freaked out, right? So which means that, you know, say, hey, what, what do you change? And so we have to explain to them, you know, what, what configuration changes are and, you know, how does that impact security? And uh, so, so that's, you know, we have to go through our own internal reviews and internal audits, and so that's, that's not fun. Um, okay, so second, you know, because of this uh, uh, shiplet, um, you know, this, this binding validation in, in, in shiplet, what we found out is, you know, shiplet, I'm not sure you guys are familiar with that, so it has this XML policy that you can set up on, you know, how to validate the, um, uh, the, the, you know, the IDPs and how to validate the uh, signatures and all that. And one of them is validate the binding, which is, you know, according to that documentation, it can be done through policies, but what we found out is it's not the case because the policy validation happened prior to the binding validation, which means it's, it's hard-coded. <laughs> so, so we would, 
we don't have a whole lot of choice but to, you know, to. Um, Can you explain what you mean by binding validation? It's just like endpoint binding, right? Let's let's say you sign a uh, SAML. Yeah. Let's say I want to sign something for you. Okay. So this is you saying this this symbol, this SAML assertion is assigned for specific for this Keystone server in this case. E exactly yeah. for the particular endpoint, and that's that endpoint is part of the signature. So doing that validation, if your endpoint does not match the request URL, you got a signature inval uh, invalid. So if, if so. we were to do a cloud with multiple regions right. that some of our customers may want, that means that we have to create relationships between each region and the service or the identity provider, rather than having one to a complete vendor that we could assert multiples in. Right. So yeah, so, so we are looking at some other alternatives, right? I mean, the second point is basically, you know, when it, like I think I touched on that part earlier, is that when you put a new service in there, you know, all kinds of stuff have to happen. We need to monitor it. You know, we want to make sure, you know, our performance is still good, and then we make sure its footprint, at, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, still within, you know, our tolerance level. And make sure it's, you know, available on the platforms that, that, that we support, right? And so that's, you know, introducing a new service on the service looks pretty simple, but, you know, for us, it's quite a bit of work. Yeah. So. And from our side, I mean, from the public cloud side, the, the customers of public cloud aren't necessarily seeing what the infrastructure to run the public cloud costs. So if they needed more to run Shibboleth on their keystones, they might be able to launch more keystones or, or make bigger keystones. On our customers, they get the entire stack, and their capacity of their stack is, the, is a little bit of it's eaten up by the control services we run. So the more control services we run, the less capacity the customer has for the stack. So that's a value proposition where if we introduce this service, they now get less cloud for their money. And that's a big concern for us. Okay, so yeah, so this is mostly my complaint is that IDP should be owned by domain, yes. right? Yes. Because, <laughs> yeah, so because, you know, for us, Self-service is very important. So because when you sign up with the public cloud, HP Public Cloud, we create your domain. You are the master of your own domain. You can, you know, you have own your own administrative domain. By that, you should be able to say, hey, you know, my users, you know, for, for cloud bursting, right? So I've been saying, hey, my, us my users are managed in my own private cloud. I should be able to, you know, hook up that through, um, you know, through, 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 uh, through federation. So right now, you can't do it. Right now, you, if you sign up with HP, um, you want your own IDP, you will have pretty much have to co-op co -op our support, and we'll file a ticket, and we'll basically have to you know, to make this configuration there, change. If the right. IDP is owned by that domain, when you set up the mapping rules, you can only map by a, a set up rules that says map to projects in that domain. Ah, OK. Right? That's, that's the second point right here. Mapping right now, we only validate the syntax. We don't validate the right. content, which means is that, you know, I can I can set up a map that maps to somebody else's domain, right. right? So there's no way, no easy way for me to validate that today. That would be bad. Is, yeah. is that a limitation of the endpoint? So you're saying like if I'm a tenant, if I'm a tenant on your network and I want to federate to another another cloud organization, I can't do that because of the endpoint validation for the. Uh, that's the, the pre the previous one. That's something yeah. that you can work around. Okay. Usually, uh, the que the question uh, was. Yeah. <laughs> the question was, uh, is the endpoint validation a reason that you have a hard time federating to? Somebody you, to to an, to a provider that you know arbitrary but the user so, arbitrarily wa wants to use yeah to keystones no that that the endpoint validation piece that's just a it's a configure it's a piece of configuration that comes along with how you run shibboleth and what, how it validates it's just the nature of a saml assertion it has to be targeted at the endpoint what's the problem here is that we don't we're right now we don't have a way of we validate that the syntax of the map the mapping is the bundle of attributes in, SAML, in the SAML assertion to something useful to Keystone. We validate that the syntax of that mapping, it's a declarative, uh, it's a declarative of like a DSL type thing um, that we wrote specifically for this, this, set of, uh, this set of tools, but it doesn't validate what the result would be. We don't have, given this assertion, what am I gonna get at the other end at the moment? You, you have to have a lot of eyes looking at it and try things. Yeah, that's it, the, no. it could map to something completely wrong, but for the most, but but we can guarantee the syntax is right, which is again, it's a rough edge. It doesn't mean that you're never that you can't use it. It's we should fix, we should make this better. Yeah, the the, the safe error is that you map to identities that don't exist, and the bad error is that you map to identities that do exist that aren't yours, and now you're able to. You're now able able to either um, create.
create instances under their account and charge them, or worse, read their instances and get access to their content, which is never a good thing. Yeah. So, so this one, you know, you know, just put it here. But I mean, to be fair, right? Right now, if you, you know, this, you know, pre-existing relationship between IDP and SP is through a, uh, you know, meta file. But if an account has been suspended at the IDP, how does the SP know to, you know, to to invalidate that token, right? This is the, then this is the immediate case of the token that is currently being used. Once the token timeout, you can't get more tokens. Yeah. yeah. So you can't extend the session. Right. You just have an active session, just like a web, like any web type service. Yeah. There's no revocation. Yeah. Yeah. So if you wanted to have a real-time revocation, you would have to build some workflow on top of that. So you know, just like the way we have the same problem with LDAP today, right? So if, if somebody, some user status change in LDAP, you know, Keystone didn't know about it. Yeah. So. The last thing is that key, you know identity federation is good, right? So I mean we solve a lot of lot of issues with that. Um, but the next step, what's the next step, right? I mean how do we how we do this complete solution of cloud federation, right? I mean how do we have a global catalog? How do we discover resource, and how do we make this workflow process more smoother? Um, I think that's that's something that it's um, um, that we'll, we'll need to take a take a look at. Yeah, for for the demo, I mean it's it's really we. Uh, on the blue box side, because everybody's a, a full admin on the cloud, all we really had to do is give them map DFT into an admin user, and they could create the flavors as they want. They can create the networks as they want. They create the images as they want. Uh, that's much harder to do in a in a public cloud environment. Yeah. Uh, but what what we really want is for uh, digital film tree to be able to do that within their domain, so that all they have to do is establish. All the providers have to do is establish that relationship and then step away. And the 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 identity provider, the source of that information can push all that they want for all those configurable, tweakable things, push that from their central place out to the endpoints, and then everything looks the same to them. Um, it's, a, it's a happy accident, or not happy accident, but it's a, it's a result of uh, some process that it, it works well in the, in the demo, but in reality, it would be a much yeah. better story to push. Yeah. So that's... So a couple of things from our end. The, the tooling for the service provider, uh, it's, it's pretty rough right now. Uh, there, there are a few things where you have to copy and paste some Python code and poke at the Keystone v3 API directly in order to get some of the mapping uh, in the configuration done, uh, which is difficult to, to administrate, difficult to automate. Um, it, it's not something we want to carry forward into a production environment. Uh, also, it involves XML written to a file system, and nobody likes that. Um, and then we're, we would like to see better visibility into the federated usage. Uh, in, our, in, in the public cloud's case, they're mapped to an actual user that exists, and that user is getting tracked for all the usage. In the blue box side, there is no user. There's just a, a project, and there's just roles or groups within that project. But as they were using the cloud, we couldn't really see that they were using the cloud. And that, from, from a... Uh, show back or from a tracking that are they are they capable of using it you know that's not visible to us and we'd, we'd really like to see that and before we take it into production as well yeah i think i think the ibm folks have a nice demo on horizon side and how to use that you know Ooh. keystone keystone federation earlier so i think that those patches may land pretty soon so. awesome yeah. so a whole bunch of completely useless weird questions here but seriously questions <coughs> please use the please please use the microphone or we can pass around back over here yeah. Uh, but I want to make sure that everybody can hear the question. And then one of us will answer. Feel free to target it at someone that you want. Sure. So with, uh, with federated identity, we, we, are a, we are able to build federations. And we've been doing that for probably something like 10 years now. Um, and and the, the typical use case is you give access to a resource that to someone that doesn't own the resource. Um, we have SAML federations. We can do the same with OpenID Connect. So my question is, can, can you talk to the relative merits of doing Keystone to Keystone federation as opposed to doing it on top of OpenStack and consider the different OpenStack deployments as, as separate relying parties that you can give other people access to? 
Um, <clears throat> um, let me think about that for a second. Um, uh, I, I, I can answer. Yeah. I'll, I'll throw something out here. So, uh, the reason why you might want to do keystone to keystone is, partic is specific to bursting from one cloud to another. So keystone has the flexibility that you can back end it with your own internal identity provider. You can back end with LDAP. That's, that's your controls. You have everything like that. So you've already got this, this uh, your local keystone, your local cloud backing into your identity pool. Uh, what you don't want to do is try and create a connection between somebody else's cloud that somebody else is administrating into your identity source. That's not a relationship that you want. What you want to be able to do is take their keystone that you're configuring, let it talk to another keystone. The other side doesn't have any access to your stuff, so it's keystone talking to keystone. It's a, it's a communication protocol that they can understand, that, and as clouds move, um, you, you you have the the API version co compatibility going on. Um, the HP Cloud was was Kilo. We were Juno. Digital Film Tree. What what was? Kilo. It was Kilo, and it didn't matter because the the protocols were set up in a way that they were able to talk to each other correctly. So it's it's really about a matter of compatibility. That was the one use case I came up yeah. with. Yeah, and, okay. and there's a second use case that's very related. What happens is you have mm -hmm. a you have Digital Film Tree, and they have a variety of people who are consuming a service. And they, each of those, each of those uh, consumers have their own identity provider. Well, do you, do you really want to, in this case, have to have you know, 15 identity, 15 people, 15 different organizations set up the mapping, uh, the, the, the trust relationship between now HP, and then you change and you add Blue Box, and now they have to set it up 15 more times. It's really about making it a little bit a little bit easier, a little bit better, better experience, or on the flip side of it, making it a little bit more opaque when you don't want that to be visible. Yeah, and I would say, yeah, to, just to add to that, yeah, I mean, we, we're, we're a, uh, a service that has clients that is then a client of other services. So, so yeah, the, the, the how transparent you want that to be or how opaque you want that to be is, is key to how we do business. So, uh, yeah, I would support that, absolutely. OK, um, I have um, a few questions and comments. I will first start with the comment. You said that you were thinking of different uh, way to integrate uh, with uh, SAML2. And um, maybe you search for a simple SAML PHP. I don't know if you know this product, but it's developed by the uh, R&D community. Um, OK, so that was actually complicates the solution. Okay. Um, so my question. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I, it wor it's worth bringing up. Thank yeah. you. It's, yeah. it's good to know. It's yeah. good to know, it and we we'll keep a look on any of those op options because maybe something will be better. Mod auth melon is one of the ones we're looking yeah. at. Lots of options. Okay. The the question I had was um, with Shiblet. Um, for the moment, I'm I'm not specialist in terms of federation, uh, but my colleague is. Um, and he basically said that the, uh, the, will, the Shibboleth version 2, if I recall correctly, will be end of support. Um, and it's been extended a few days ago or something like that to 12 additional months. But what, what is the plan in the future? So you saw us mention well, us. I wasn't even sitting up there. Uh, I'm Adam Young, work for Red Hat, I'm Keystone Core. Um, when we were evaluating the different ways of implementing Shibboleth, um, there were a couple things that stuck out. And the biggest one, from my opinion, was the fact that I had to do something different on the client side than on the server side. And there's a library out there called Lasso that we could use on both sides. And Mod Melon is an Apache module that does that. Now, Mod Melon also does not require spooling out to another service to do the Shibboleth stuff. So I really like the idea of Mod Melon, uh, Lasso, and then that being the, the, the groundwork of our strategy there. So I think it's going to be something along those lines, having said that. And on, the, on that note, a lot of what we're tied to in Shibboleth is tied to the Apache modules that are available in distributions. Once, if a distribution moves to the new stuff, the, the, the later versions that, are, that aren't near end of life, we will obviously be moving with them and making sure we support. A lot of it was, this was developed on Trusty. Trusty has very specific 
garments and same thing you know and, and support of CentOS and, and RHEL. I mean, there's just specific versions that are out there and if a distribution, if we're, locked, we're locked to really what the distributions have in this case because it's outside of OpenStack. It is a service that is available via the distributions. Long term, of course, we will move. A quick question, and maybe you got maybe this is a bigger question. If I have, um, if I have multi-region, and so let's say I have three um, separate OpenStack installs, have you guys ever considered like uh, the ability to confederate within an identity? So if I want to establish a trust relationship between, say, partner A, my organization, I've got three different installs. I could federate, have one relationship initially, and those other installs are are basically already associated with um, one of the Keystone boxes, as opposed to if I have you know, eight different sites, and then I'm, I'm setting up point-to-point -point or separate federations with each of those organizations? Yeah, I mean, you should be able to do that with multiple regions because, I mean, it, d it depends on how you set up the, the providers. You can have a chain of providers configured in, in, in Shiblet. Remember what he said about a mapping to an existing identity? Once you have that mapping set up once, you can map multiple federations to that same identity. Come in by different maps right. to the same identity. And so do a single identity? Yeah. Okay. You yeah. can do it. You don't have to do it. So, uh, question with, with, with regards to how Keystone and Amazon kind of could, could federate. I mean, have you guys considered exposing identity from Keystone to Amazon? And I don't know if it even makes sense, but but what about vice versa, right? I mean, could you take IAM identities from Amazon and make that available on an OpenStack cloud? Right. We have considered making Keystone a full-fledged IDP. Let's. We have. We chose to avoid doing so for both simplicity's sake and that we weren't sure that was the right choice. There are many, many extra things that come along with making Keystone a full-fledged IDP. It. Theoretically, you could probably do it today. It would be a little stubby, and it has some limitations. Uh, it's not off the table. We're definitely open to considering these types of things. Please come to maybe one of the one of the work sessions and talk with the Keystone development team and explain, you know, and, and help us understanding the your your specific use case in that uh, for that. And we'll consider it. I mean, with the right amount, with the right type of demand, the clear benefits will will work that and. In reverse, um, you know, as you said with the IAM, uh, it same kind of thing. It's help us understand the use cases, help us understand what the clear benefits are, and we're not going to say no to. That, well, that, that should be a different, just a, as another it, federa it, federation thing. I think it's one that we should be, deliberately yeah. deliberately look at. But it could, I don't it know what AIM be. exposes as far as federation protocols. If it did SAML, then we could potentially make it work right now. Um, we'd have to see what, what the modules are, if it's not SAML, and how, what the path would be to do that. But mostly it's mo a lot of it like OIDC, using OIDC or SAML. Really, at that point, it's a configuration and using the right module in Apache to get the attributes out. Okay, thanks. Okay, um, it's a more technical question about how, uh, how to get things. Uh, you said that you mapped an IDP to a single account for the HP Public Cloud. And um, I would like to understand, how did you plan to do the role-based access control? Um, are all are the members um, of an IDP only members for, the, for a single account? Or do you have different roles, like, for example, an administrator and sub roles or something like that? Yes. We, Did you we, plan? We, yeah. We have okay. those in H3 Cloud. So when you sign up with H3 Cloud, we create a domain for you. So you basically have your own administrative domain. And then you can create domain-specific roles. <laughs> so, so you, know, you can um, assign roles to, to, the, to, the, to the users in your own domain. Um, but that's different from from federation because once once federation is about how do you you know establish a trust and once you establish a trust, you basically fall into the service provider's administrative domain. So you can set up the map says, hey, I want to map it to the user, and then the user can, you know, whatever access that user have is totally controlled by the service provider, right? Well, yeah. So the 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 service per, the identity provider will push down to you what the user is, and then on the service provider side, that's where the mapping comes in. Of these particular users map into this role, or these 
you can define uh, uh, groups or you can define uh, regexes for how you want to map the user identity that's coming in into what rights they have on the cloud itself. And it's a service provider level configuration. Yeah. Provide, yeah. The service provider is the service provider is authoritative for author for the authorization decisions. That's that that comes from the service provider. That's, that's another reason why we want to be able to push. No, that. but yeah. that's uh, can we have time for one more question? Steve, uh, the floor Are recognizes you, the gentleman from IBM. You're really gonna let Steve ask a question? Yes, <laughs> I am. Absolutely. This is this is total. Uh, you're. You, Go ahead. <laughs> I just wanted to know a little bit more about um, how HP Public Cloud is deploying Keystone under Apache and with the modules, with the like mod chip and stuff like that. Right. So we basically deploy, um, yeah, with with Apache, with uh, Shiplet, and with mod Shiplet. The how whole. Are you deploying? What do you mean? How? Oh, we have our own ship, uh, uh, recipes okay. that we basically. Um, we basically create the data bags for the um, the meta XML file, for example, and we have um, uh, recipes for the for the configuration file changes. Uh, yeah, I hope so. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Uh, I I think we're at the end here. Appreciate you coming. And uh, there is. I'm, we got one more, one quick thing. There's a white paper, and I'm going to hand this off so that you can get where the address. Oh, oh hi. There's a white paper with a. It's pretty high level of about the background of the technologies used in the camera to couch demo. It's on openstack.org/enterprise under workload portability. Thank you.